All right, friends, we're continuing our adventure into the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. And as we discussed in uh, previous lectures, this is the Tantric Practice Manual par excellence. This is going to be a little bit of a trademark statement. I keep saying it. In every lecture that I pull out the Vijnana Bhairava, I find myself saying this one line over and over again. Uh, because it is a text of 112 practices. And today we're going to look at actually an accompanying text, a text that came much later that was probably heavily influenced by this text. And I truly believe that through the study and contemplation of this second text, a lot about the strategy in this text can be uncovered. So let's quickly say a few things about what the strategy here is. Now, the central philosophical insight of the Trika Krama school of Tantra, meaning the non-dual school of Tantra, is as follows. Awareness is the absolute principle of existence, but this awareness is full of joy. You know, that's, that's the central theme of Tantra, this, this sense of awareness overflowing with joy. It's almost like if you translated the word Chid Ananda, you could translate it like this, uh, consciousness bliss. I'm sure you mostly see it like this, right? Consciousness bliss. Most English transliterations translate Chid Ananda as just consciousness bliss. Consciousness hyphen bliss. And that makes sense because um, Chid Ananda has that quality of being one word, one principle that consciousness is bliss and bliss is consciousness. Kind of like saying truth is beauty and beauty is truth. Hmm? However, um, some of the tantric masters, they give it different names. Like for instance, um, Chid Ananda Gana which has the connotation of awareness replete with joy or suffused with joy. And sometimes it would be perfectly fair to translate this as awareness that's in love with itself. You know, isn't that awareness that's full of self-love? So if we think about what love is, we ask the question, okay, I love things. I love my dog. I love my plants. I love my spouse. I love my house. Like, what is it to love something? Very quickly, we realize love is nothing but attention and reverence. Where there is love, there is attention directed along the lines of sacredness, reverence, gratitude. So in other words, love is a very, I guess you could say, to use a new age term, high frequency experience. That's a lot like enthusiasm, gratitude, joy, but it has to do with the quality of attention. Notice, if you're grateful for something, chances are you're more aware of it in that moment. You're like looking at it more. You're like, I'm so happy there's a sunset here. Notice that feeling of gratitude. What it is truly is a heightening of awareness, a heightening of presence, a feeling of sacredness and reverence. Last night, we discussed in depth how to do a tantric puja or rather not that, but what the role of tantric puja was. And last night we realized, wow, it's such a powerful opportunity to cultivate reverence. As you go through these ceremonial procedures, chanting the appropriate mantras in the appropriate places, you evoke beauty by using flour and sandalwood paste and incense and all of that. And it creates sacredness and reverence, which does what? If not increase the quality of attention. You know, so you could say whenever there is bliss, there is awareness becoming aware of itself. Bliss then becomes the central kind of focus in Tantra. So we can even call Tantra the Suk Upaya, which is the path of bliss. Ananda Upaya, Ananda Upaya, path of bliss or Suk Upaya, the, the easy way, the easy path. But don't, don't be mistaken. There's nothing easy about it. It's simple, but incredibly complex, as you will soon see in this text. Okay, now we know that awareness is full of joy. The second claim from Tantra is that this joy is a kind of inspiration and it demands expression. So this joy causes awareness to emanate forth the world into existence as an expression of its joy. So everything that you see around you is matter, but that matter cannot be something other than awareness. Because as we said last night, it would be absolutely incoherent to posit the existence of matter objectively and independently outside of the subject to whom it occurs. You know, so you can't say uh, the matter occurs to me. No, you have to say it occurs within me. It occurs within awareness. So then we say, okay, everything in the world is made up of awareness. It can't be made up of anything outside of awareness. Awareness alone is the ground of all being. And you could say matter reduces to energy and energy reduces to awareness. But that awareness, as we said earlier, is full of bliss. 
It's Chidananda Gana. So the experience of the tantric master is looking around the world and seeing nothing but that awareness blazing forth as this table or as that person, as a Diego or as a Blue Yeti microphone. All of it is just God appearing to God for the sake of bliss, you know? So you can do this process. Like you can look and say, okay, like look at Diego. I'm very, you know, excited to see Diego. You're looking at him. So there's the body. This body is not at all Diego, right? How could it be? It's a wonderful form, very functional and handsome and all is great, but it's changing all the time. There was a child Diego, there's an adolescent Diego, there's a young Diego, and hopefully, God willing, there's going to be old Diego. And then like bearded Diego, you know, like with white beard, you know, like there's going to be all these different changes. I could say, well, which one is the Diego? And you couldn't point to any one of those bodies and be like, that's a Diego. Diego is clearly not the body that represents the Diego. There's something deeper, something beyond that. So I go a little deeper and I say, well, okay, it's the personality, right? There's a person there. But what is a personality? It's a co con continual flux of ideas. It would be a disservice for me to say Diego is this and not that. There are whole facets of this gentleman's personality that I don't know, that he probably doesn't know, that um, isn't static, that's always shifting and changing. Yet, there is some center, some point around which the mind and body of Diego circulate. So now the question becomes, when I meet a cat, when I meet a rose, when I meet a Mikey, am I more interested in the body phenomenon, the mind phenomenon, or the awareness that's there? That's the only question a spiritual person has to ask. So if I'm able to see beyond the body and mind to the unchanging witness that is a rose, then what's happening is I'm encountering myself appearing to myself, the self awareness, and it should be full of joy, full of bliss. So this is to say that the experience of the tantric master in the world is one of chamatkara. Chamatkara means aesthetic rapture, or maybe we can translate that to relish. I like that English word relish. You should be able to relish every single one of your experiences. Why? Because you see in it and you experience in it nothing other than the immediacy of your own essence nature, awareness replete with bliss. But not only that, because I said earlier, this awareness is full of desire to create. It's always in every moment creating through you. You know, it's using phonemes like sounds and words and names to emanate forth through your very eyes, this personal world that you live in. So you can almost think of it as like Shiva wanting to play the game of a cat. You know, like Shiva desires, and you could say, well, what did Shiva do when he came down as Hanuman? He worshiped Ram, right? Like that's his joy. Like Shiva's joy is to worship Rama. You know, he loves to worship Vishnu. Shiva loves, and when Vishnu comes, what does he do? Rama worships Shiva. They love to worship. So now Shiva is coming through cat. What is Shiva wanting to do? Taking cat to work more worship, more spirituality. That's what Shiva wants to do, right? Now cat has two choices. Either cat can resist the will of Shiva, which is flowing through you as a natural upsurge of inspiration and do something else that would be more practical, like work on your investment portfolio. Or you could surrender completely to the will of the Lord flowing through you. That's the only two options that cat has. Either one, whatever she chooses, it's Shiva. That's the thing about tantric non-duality. There's no real cat. So even if cat chooses against God's will, that was still God's will. What it means is Shiva wants to play the game of like a miserable corporate lawyer first, and then he'll be a niche. You know what I mean? So now it's not just that you should feel bliss and joy in every moment, but you should also feel a kind of dialogue with awareness. Even though you know this is a non-dualistic tradition, there should be a sense in each and every one of your moments of being guided by some deep inner voice that you relate to as a, a deity like Shiva or more appropriately Para, the goddess Para, the supreme goddess, who is sometimes called Paravak, the word, the supreme word. So she emanates forth as like an instinct. I'll come to a yoga class at five o'clock on Friday. You know, I'll go and do this or I'll go and do that. So you flow along these lines. How do we achieve that though? Like by, by what practice does a person come to live in this way with open-eyed wonder, with a sense of this body being your very own body? Remember, now we're talking about it in a conceptual way, but once this like actual way of looking at the world, which is after all the truth, becomes enmeshed and, and established in your experience, then it will go from concept or conception to perception. That's the spiritual life. You go from a conception of truth to a perception of truth. At that point, you can actually say with authenticity, Vishva Sharira Shivaika Rupa Eva Kevalam, which in Sanskrit means this entire world is the body of Shiva and that alone am I. 
You should feel that. When you look at other people, you should feel like a total intimacy with them. So now, the way that a yogi would do this, and we're going to compare it with the meditation we're doing today. Hello, dear Angela. Welcome. Now, the way that a yogi would do this is by um, sitting and through repetitive, nonstop practice, break down all the thought constructs that uh, make up this world of differentiation, right? So this is called yoga. The, the method of yoga is to bring the mind to a single point and then drop that point and you in that moment achieve a state of thoughtlessness. But in order to do that, you probably have to leave behind society because the thing about the world is that it's full of like impressions. You can't drive down the street without seeing a billboard that brings out lust. You can't like walk down a street without seeing a store that brings out greed. You meet other people every day and they have ideas and thoughts and their vibes are brushing against yours. And it's, it's almost impossible to meditate in the middle of a hustling, bustling city. So what ends up happening is that a yogi typically who is very serious about yogic sadhana, like Raja Yoga, Patanjali Raja Yoga, will leave behind the city and go into the mountains, go into the Himalayan mountainside and sit and meditate in a place where uh, he, she or they are alone in a place where there aren't a lot of sounds or distractions. And gradually, truly, in a short period of time, I would argue, they come to have mastery over their mind. They think less and less and less and less thoughts until there's only one thought left, the object of their meditation. They drop that. And at that point, they experience chamatkara, total immersion in the oneness of all existence. Okay, that's one path. Yes, that's the path of yoga. Now, today's meditation will explore the tantric path which is actually in many ways directly opposing yoga. It's in direct opposition to yoga, though it's deeply indebted to yoga. Without mastering meditation to some degree, the techniques that I'm going to share with you today will be largely fruitless, you know? Because as you'll see soon, it requires like some meditative ability. Okay, so let me read you then this stuff that we're going to look at today. Where is it? Okay. So here, uh, we're looking at the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. We're going to do some meditations from this. But today, let's look at the Swabodha Manjari. And in the Swabodha Manjari, it's a text that comes much later after the, like maybe 400 years after the Vijnana Bhairava, we get this text, Swabodha uh, Manjari. Swabodha, uh, um, yeah, Swabodha, what it does is it tells us stuff from the Vijnana Bhairava, but in like a little bit more of a modern and updated way. It's by the great tantric master Viranata or Vamana. Um, and he was a disciple of Kairavati who in turn was a disciple of Gyanitranata, who started this whole non-dual kind of tantra lineage, you know. Um, Kairavati was a woman, which I think is very special. So Gyanitra's master was a woman, and Gyanitra's central disciple was a woman, and she was the master of the author who put together this um, Swaba, uh, Swaboda Daya Manjari. Okay, so in the Swaboda Daya Manjari, we get this line. The nature of the mind is unsteady being inundated by the subliminal impressions arising from false mental constructs, right? We get that in yoga, these verbal delusions, vikalpas. Now, realizing this, one sets out to dissolve the mind. Vikalpa shaya, the dissolution of the mind with all of its differential thought constructs is the end goal of all spiritual practice. Whether it's Patanjali yoga or Tantra, the idea is to have a direct, immediate contact with reality without any thoughts about it, you know, because these thoughts are always going to create a sense of alienation and separation. Okay, so this process of dissolution and the word he's using here in Sanskrit is Nirodha, which of course references the Yoga Sutra, was taught by the ancients as being caused by the yoga of renunciation and hard repetitive practice. Here, I will teach dissolution of the ordinary mind through the release of effort. So he's supposed he's saying, oh, there's different meditation now. Instead of bringing your mind and fixing it on one thing, I'm going to show you a different way to meditate. And so let's see what he says. By the way, I'm reading some of the translations from Harish Sarab. So now verse 15 to 16. Here's an example of the type of meditation that um, Viranatha is telling us to do. 
whatever captivating sound that comes into one's hearing, such as a gong or the sound of rumbling thunder, one should become, and here the word in Sanskrit is eka grata, which means one pointed on it until dissolving, the mind will dissolve with it. One should not think on what has just dissolved, but one should remain full of the intensified sense of one's own immediate being. Do you see? It's kind of a revolutionary method. Instead of running away from the world, the world which previously was an obstacle is now the means to its own end. You know, Tantra, our motto is we rise by that which tripped us up in the past. So here, a loud sound. It's like, oh my God, a yogi would hate that, right? The yogi's trying to meditate and wow, a loud sound comes. Here, the Swabodha Daya Manjari is saying, no, meditate on that. Fix your mind on the sound. The way it works is that every sound has a certain moment where it arises in your awareness, a moment where it vibrates in your awareness, it hits a certain peak intensity, then it fades away. So then there's a kind of decay of the sound. As the sound gets softer, you have to become more focused. You have to follow the sound into dissolution. If you are successful at keeping your mind anchored to the sound, when the sound disappears, your mind will go with it. Do you see? If the sound disappears and your mind is attached to the sound, your mind will disappear too, which is when you have a direct immediate encounter of awareness. It's like a, a, a spontaneous awakening, right? And you can do it with any sound, like the sound of a bell, which we'll play in a little bit. So that's one. Then we look at verse um, 38. Some of you are really going to enjoy this. I should tell you that the Sanskrit word here is surata, but it could have been swarata. So this either means good lovemaking or it means uh, self-pleasuring. It's not clear. The original manuscript, that V or that U, it's not clear as to which one it is, but probably both. So here's the verse. One should cast one's mind into the point between the navel and the sex organ. Here in Sanskrit, it's called kanda, which in Qigong is the lower dantian. That's like a space about four fingers below the navel at the very base, like the lower belly there. So it says one should cast one's mind into the point between the navel and the sex organ, the kanda, at the end of good surata, swarata, hard to say, lovemaking or self-pleasuring. As the bliss of lovemaking dies away, one may become waveless. Nivritti is the Sanskrit here. The mind becomes still in a moment. Do you see? So lest you think this is pleasure seeking, the point of this is actually not pleasure. The point of this is to meditate on intensity of sensation. Yes, pleasure. But more importantly, it's to follow that into its dissolution. You're more interested in the moment when that pleasure fades than the pleasure itself, because your focus is not the cognition, but the awareness in which that cognition resides. Do you see? Very subtle, very, very advanced technique of meditation. Okay, I'll give you one more from this. And this one I just did um, because I just went and got some ice cream. So this is verse 42. And it says, keep a delicious confection on the tip of your tongue. When the pleasure of the flavor fades away, liberation arises. That's it. So simple. Whenever you're tasting something sweet, the same practice. You notice it's all the three, three practices. It's the same. Any feeling, any cognition, any moment of intensity, meditate on that. And then when it fades, your mind should fade too. Now, at this point, you should say, okay, that's not so easy though. It sounds great. Oh, I get to taste sweet things. I get to have orgasms. I get to, you know, it's not that easy because you'll notice the mind is so restless that when you try to do this, you're probably going to be overwhelmed by the intensity of that experience and lose your control, lose your focus, lose your meditation. And the mind's going to want to go to the next high. You know, when you take a bite of something sweet, the next thing you want is something salty or another bite. You know, like I took a lick of this ice cream that I just got, which was awesome, but I got some sprinkles on it. I found my mind immediately wanting to take a bite of the sprinkles just for a change of texture. The ice cream is soft. The sprinkles is hard. Now my mind wants something new to enjoy. You see, so it's not so easy. Um, typically, when a pleasure arises, we hit the peak and then we want another peak. We are what we call peak chasers. 
This is what we might call appetitive consumption, where we're just enjoying things for the sake of enjoying them. Some people accuse us tantrikas of being sensualists and hedonists. We are the opposite. Do you see how this is the opposite of sensuality? You're more interested in pleasure ending, but we're not timid about pleasure either. So we're not repressed, nor are we overindulgent. We're simply interested in awareness. Yes. Okay, one more thought, and then we can begin our formal meditation practice for the day. Um, and this is from Bhuti Raja's poem, Swa Bodha Siddhi. I think it casts a lot of light as to how these practices from the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra work. So let's look at this Bhuti Raja text, Swa Bodha Siddhi. It's a poem here, translated by Harish Surab as follows. I venerate the supreme Shiva located in the self who can be known only in Svabodha, which means self-awakening, who is devoid of the mental torment of fixation on any specific doctrine. I love that line. I bow to the benevolent one, the destroyer of the flood of vikalpas or conceptual thought constructs, free from the snare of the mind's imaginings, transcending even the level of the highest bliss. Then he goes on to say in verse nine, the method of attaining the goal, and mark this carefully, is to be constantly awake to one's own awareness. By this means, the sage achieves the state free of differentiation. In Sanskrit, avikalpa, non-differentiated uh, thought constructs. There is no method other than staying with the awareness of one's own being. Clearly maintaining awareness of this alone, the yogi becomes joyful and thus rests in the self. Do you see? Okay, wonderful. So we're going to do some yoga poses now. We'll do a few stretching, just moving the body a little bit. Um, you can do it in a chair, nothing to, and, and they're all optional. They're all optional poses. But before we do the poses, the reason I took this time to give you this uh, preamble is because it should change your relationship to yoga where before you're like oh i need to practice these poses in order to attain enlightenment no you don't the only thing you need to do to attain enlightenment is to be aware of the awareness in which any stretching sensation occurs you have nothing to gain from the practice of yoga but with this knowledge you have everything to gain from it you know, the practice of yoga is not intrinsically beneficial to you. It won't give you anything you don't already have. But when you know what it's for, then you can get more out of it. Because every time a sensation arises in the body, you can be like, oh, I meditate on that. You see, and yoga gives you in these postural poses, gives you so many ways to feel your energy and feel the embodied experience of life that you can just have a series of mini micro meditations as per the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. Right? How nice. Um, next, you know now that ritual practice, puja, is very beneficial. But what these texts like the Swa Bodha Daya Manjari and the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra is saying is that what makes those things valuable is the quality of awareness that it produces, not actually the activity. So do your puja, do your hatha yoga, do your pranayama, do everything that you would otherwise do in your spiritual life. But just remember, none of that is it. None of that is the point. And at some point, it will be transcended. Because at that point, your whole day will be puja. Every moment will be an opportunity to awaken to yourself. You know? So, let's get started then. I just wanted to read one more thing. One more thing that I wanted to read here. Yeah, never mind. Sorry, we have enough. So let's start our practice. Now we'll do a few poses and then we're going to do some pranayama from the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra and we're going to close with a meditation from the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. So if you'd like, you can come and take a cross-legged pose or you can just stay in your chair or you can just start meditating now. So if you prefer to just close the eyes and meditate, remember, it doesn't matter one way or another. Whatever the cognition is that you're experiencing is just as good as any other cognition for the practice of this yoga. So do whatever you'd like. And here I'll just like guide us through a couple of poses if it is interesting to you to do them. And they'll take about maybe 10 or so minutes, nothing too much. 
So coming and sitting in some cross-legged position that is interesting to you. Here I'm sitting in Ardha Padmasana with one foot on top of one thigh. I could also just as well be stacking my shins for Agni Stambhasana, which is a nice pose also. And I could just as easily be crossing my shins for Sukhasana, easy pose, which I think is appropriate today, given that we're talking about the Sukupaya, the easy way. <laughs> now, let's on the next inhale, take the arms out through the sides. So they're wide like an albatross's wingspan. And on the next inhale, take the arms up into the air. And maybe the arms are slightly wider than the shoulders, like a V-shape. Now curl the pinky side of the palms towards the wall behind you. So your upper outer arm is curling towards your face. Then exhale, bring the hands back down. As you exhale and take the hands out through the sides, feel how your shoulders are relaxing away from your ears. This puja table needs to move it. Okay. Inhale again, taking the hands up through the sides. Very simple motions here. The slower you move, the more of the texture of this you will attain. Exhale, bring the hands back down. Imagine you're moving your limbs through some kind of thick honey or something. Really feel like you're underwater and moving slowly. Feel the way the air kind of tugs against you as you inhale, take the arms up. Dropping the shoulders, relaxing the base of the neck. And if you feel like it, you can bring the palms all the way together if that feels nice. And exhale, this time bring the hands down over the heart. So palms together, Anjali Mudra. Let the thumbs maybe brush the forehead, the lips, and rest in the heart. Pause here. Inhale, take the arms up through the sides again. Relax the jaw, soften the base of the neck. Exhale, bring the hands down. So moving slowly to feel the subtle movements of the body. Beautiful. Inhale one more time. And this time we're going to take a back bend. So as you inhale, taking the arms up through the sides, kind of like a qigong mentality, slowly moving the hands. This time, press palms, lift the chin, and arch the upper back slightly. And then exhale, bring the hands down over the heart. So this should be kind of ecstatic and fluid. Now we'll add a sound. So I'll do om, ah, u, um, but you could just as easily do hung or kring or whatever other bij mantra you like. Now, as you bring the hands down, you chant up, meaning on the exhale, energy moves up. The ah, u, and ung, by the way, is an ng sound, striking the upper palate. So inhale, take the hands up through the sides. Whatever mantra you do, it probably ends with an m, which is really an ung sound. On the exhale, maybe after the back bend, exhale your mantra. Ah. Again, inhale, take the hands up through the sides. Palms together, lifting the chin, arching the upper back. Exhale your mantra. Uh... One more time, taking the hands up through the sides. And exhaling your mantra. Uh... Perhaps keeping the hand over the heart for this opening invocation. Oh. Namah Shivaya Satatam Panchakritya Vidhayane Chidananda Ganna Svatma Paramatava Bhasine Om Bhaiya Sarvam Ravayati Sarvago Vyapako Kile Itti Bhairava Shabdasya Santato Charanachivaha Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Inhale, take the arms up one more time. And this time, bring the left fingertips to the floor behind you, right hand to the left knee, and start to twist over to the left. 
So just a gentle twist here. If the neck allows, you might gaze over the left shoulder head, keeping the crown of the head in line with the opening in the throat. Feel as if you are melting that left shoulder head into an imaginary wall behind you, broadening across the chest. Inhale, come out, take the arms up into the air again. Arms up and reach through the crown of your head, grow the length of the spine a smidgen and exhale, bring the right fingertips to the floor, bring the left hand to the right thigh and twist over to the right. Even as you twist, there should be a spiraling up motion as if you're trying to climb the crown of your head up towards the ceiling. So bringing a little bit of lift in the crown of the head and just coming into a nice twist as you exhale, finding a little more of that twist, really enjoying this corkscrewing pos position. It's almost like you're churning the base of the spine to rouse that kundalini shakti that lies dormant in that region. All right, start to unwind from that twist. Inhale, take both arms up into the air again. Bring the left fingertips to the floor and start to walk the left fingertips out to the left as you take a side stretch over to the left. Roll the top ribs back. So the idea is that you're opening across the chest, broadening across the collarbones. Try to keep the forehead higher than the chin. So if you'll see me here, my forehead is not dropping. I'm bringing my forehead up. So when I look up, the chin is lower than the forehead. If you like, you can even bring your left elbow to the floor. Good. Inhale, take the arms back up into the air. You should feel an opening in the right hip and then now in the left hip. Exhale, walk the right arm out to the right and take your sideways bend. As you lean to the right, your left hip wants to come with you. So keep your left hip pinned down even as you take this side bend. Roll the left ribs back so that you're broad across the chest. And if the neck allows, look up at that raised left arm. Breathe into this place here at the base of the hip. Inhale, come back up to center. And exhale, this time let's fold forward. So you're bringing the belly down over the shins. Now it's perfectly nice to bring a block underneath the forehead. So if you want to rest your head on the floor, do it. But if you have a block or some pillows, it can be nice to just bring the forehead onto the block. So these are very good ways to create space in the hips space in the lower back, middle back, and upper back. It's very difficult to practice any spirituality without some kind of method of moving energy around the body. You know, it's almost impossible to practice brahmacharya, which is sexual continence, without loose and open hips. It's really just improbable for a man to do that. Inhale, let's come out. And now, Exhale, bring the hands back over the heart. So we're taking the arms up. Exhale, bring the hands back over the heart. Beautifully done. And let the hands fall to the lap. Now you might like to change the cross of the legs. So changing the cross of the legs to change the texture of this pose. So whichever shin was on top, switch it. So a bottom shin is there. Inhale, take the arms up through the sides. Maybe taking that back bend again, pressing palms, lifting the chin, arching the upper back. And then exhaling, folding forward, diving down, sending the sternum forward and coming to rest the forehead on a block or on the floor or on a stack of pillows or something. Just coming to fold the belly over the thighs. Yeah, like that. Folding and tuck the chin round the upper back. Relax into this posture to any degree that feels appropriate. Remember, as we discussed in the opening of the class, it's not about how the shape looks. There's nothing for you to gain from this practice that you don't already have. Any cognition, any sensation in the body is as good as any other occasion to awaken to the awareness in which that very cognition is vibrating. So like we learned in the Swa Bodha Daya Manjari, the loud sound of thunder or a gong is an opportunity to awaken to what you are. By focusing your mind on the sound, when the sound dissolves, your mind, having been made ekagrata, dissolves with the sound, leaving you in a state of avikalpa paramarshena, immersion into non-conceptual, pre-discursive, immediate reality. You can do the exact same thing with any sensations you feel in this practice too. All right, let's inhale and come out. You might walk the hands back or take the hands up, however you'd like to come out. Exhale, bring the hands back over the heart. 
and let's take tabletop pose now. So just a few more poses before we meditate. Coming to stand on the hands and knees in tabletop pose. Inhaling to lift the chin, arch the upper back. Cow pose, press the sternum forward, drop the belly. Exhale, tuck the chin, round the upper back, lift the sides of the navel up into the spine. Cat pose. Inhale, come forward to cow, lifting the chin, arching the upper back. So a very serpentine motion here. Exhale, tucking the chin, rounding the upper back, lifting the sides of the navel into the spine. Use your hands and knees to press into the mat as you flow. Inhale, come up to cow. One more time. Exhale, come to cat. Last time, lift the patch of skin between the shoulder blades just a smidgen higher, spreading the shoulder blades apart. Then inhale, return to tabletop. Bring the big toes together, heels apart, and exhale, sink the hips into the heels for child's pose. Remember to bring a block under your head if that feels more comfortable for you. If your hips are very far away from the heels, then the higher up you bring your forehead, the lower down your hips will be, which gives you so much space in this pose. Despite its name, child's pose is not child's play. It's not that easy a pose. But it does open up the middle and upper back and it does give you so much space in the outer hips as well as the inner groin. Especially if your knees are apart slightly. Though traditionally the knees are all the way together so that it's more of a back bend. Now in a traditional child's pose, the arms reach back. So you're more like a seed. So if you'd like to reach the arms back, you can with the palms resting by the ankles. See how much more intimate it is to be like curled up into a ball like this. All right, my friends, just a few moments here and we've concluded our asana portion of the class. And we'll move in a few moments to pranayama, which is practicing with the breath. And this practice is, of course, from the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra and it will mirror a little bit what you were doing with the mantra earlier. These are of course all secret practices. They are generally quite closely guarded in tantric circles because they are very powerful, but also it can be kind of a waste of time if we're not really sure what we're doing. So we're going to proceed cautiously and attentively. And so before we take up any of the exercises in the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, it's nice to just stretch a bit, move the body, create a little bit of space in the middle and upper back, create some space in the hips, open up some channels up and down the spine. And maybe even now you can sense that the nostrils have cleared up slightly. Maybe breath seems more expansive and spacious. As a result of stretching your middle and upper back in this pose, maybe you're starting to feel like there's more room in the torso, especially in the back body, to breathe. This is very important. This is the piece that most people miss when coming to Tantra, and that is some facility with the body, with the embodied experience of being here. Okay, so when you're ready, come and sit up and take your meditation posture. So take any meditation posture that you like, cross-legged, kneeling, sitting in a chair, whatever that feels nice. For this though, it, it's good to keep the spine upright. We will lie down in a few moments, but for now, let's come and see that the head, the neck, and the spine are all in alignment. And as you sit up tall, relax. So both strength yet softness expresses itself in the way that you sit. And as you sit up tall, there should be a feeling of space in each vertebral disc as you grow the spine and space across the collarbones as you broaden the chest. And at the same time, soften the jaw, relax the base of the neck and tuck the chin in ever so slightly. And as you bring the face down slightly, it's a gesture of humility, reverence, but also in a practical way, it opens up space in the back of your neck, which is very good for this practice. All right. Let's take up the first meditation now, or the first pranayama. Remember in the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, 
Shakti or Parvati or Bhairavi expresses to Shiva that she has studied everything there is to study. She says, my Lord, I've studied the whole Trika school of Tantra. I've studied texts one after another, each more essential than the last. And still I am confused. What is the ultimate nature of reality? And this whole text is Shiva's reply to that question. But notice he doesn't give a teaching. He gives 112 practices. It's not enough to tell you. One must show you. So these practices are all designed to convey a direct experience of truth. Let's pick up the first one. Shri Bhairava Uvacha Bhairava said Urdve Prano Hiyadho Jivo Visargatma Parocharet Utpati Dvitayastane Baranad Baritastitahi The exhaling breath should ascend and the inhaling breath should descend, both forming a visarga, meaning a conjunct of two points. Their state of fullness is found by fixing them in the two places of their origin. So, to break that down, all it says is, imagine that as you inhale, you are inhaling down through the crown of your head and down into the base of your heart. And imagine that as you exhale, the exhalation was emerging from the base of the heart and moving up the spine and out through the crown of the head. So as opposed to thinking of breathing as merely air moving in and out of the nose and in and out of the lungs, we are invited now to consider breathing as an act of moving prana up and down the spine. Inhalation, apana vayu. Take the air down from the region above the crown of your head into the region at the base of the heart. Gently inhale. And then on the exhale, feel as if this air, or rather this prana, is ascending like a current of energy up from the base of the heart, out through the crown of the head. This, as we said in a previous class, is the visarga, the conjunct of two points between the Dwadash Anta, that region above your head, and the Hridayam, the center of the chest, the heart. So let's do this for just a few moments, inhaling up and down the spine. As you start to feel for the breath as a movement of energy, let's consider the next verse. Marutontar bahir vapi viyad yugmani vartanat bairavya bairavasyetam bairavi vyajyate vapuhu. Oh bairavi, by focusing one's awareness on the two voids at the end of the internal and external breath, thereby the glorious form of Bhairava is revealed through Bhairavi. So here we are asked to meditate on that moment when the exhale ends before the inhale begins, and again on that moment when the inhale ends and the exhale begins. So that gap in between inhale and exhale, here is called a void. Focus on that place. Inhaling, smoothly and naturally, down the spine. At the end of the inhale, consider that small gap before the inhale turns naturally into an exhale. As you empty out the lungs and complete the exhale, Attend to that momentary pause before the exhale turns into the inhale yet again.
please note that this is not anava upaya. It's not a practice that you do. It's just something naturally occurring that you're invited to notice. So it's not that you're deepening the breath or breathing in any kind of modified or conditioned way. You're simply feeling for the movement of energy up and down the spine that is naturally occurring anyway as you inhale and exhale. The inhale naturally draws you back into your center. Every inhale is a return to the source. Every exhale is an expression of that source emanating forth as a world. This in-breath and out-breath is really the inhalation and exhalation of God. You are not breathing so much as you are being breathed by the oscillating, pulsating, nectarian ecstasy that is Shiva, the spanda, the vibration of all being. So this should be incredibly sweet. The exercise just prescribed should not at all be strenuous. Everything about this must be simple, sweet, and to some extent effortless. You're just breathing, and you're just becoming interested in what's going on in the beginning and the end of each breath cycle, or each half of the breath cycle. Now, we've thoroughly covered these two verses in previous classes. I think henceforth we're going to use them as a kind of warm-up for the material in this text. So it's almost like whenever we start these practices, we'll do a few poses and we'll almost assuredly do this first two practices, verse 24 and 25. Given that Bhairava opens with these techniques, it's implied that perhaps they are not guaranteed to be true, but it's implied that they are perhaps fundamental or foundational. Just becoming aware of the breath, noticing the way it moves up and down the spine energetically, and noticing the pause in between the inhale and exhale, and again between the exhale and inhale. Now I'll read to you verse 40. Uh, nine. Okay, actually I'll do 8, 48, 49, and 50. Now I'm giving you three verses. They can all be done one after the other, or you can choose whichever one that you like the most and just stay with that for the final few moments of the class. So I'm going to present something like a Shaktopaya, something almost like a Shambhava Upaya, for those of you who know those terms. And remember, there are three verses. You can choose whichever one you'd like to do, and I'll just leave you to that. Verse 48. Remember that the method here is, as we described in the opening of this class, one of simply being more interested in awareness than in whatever is arising within the field of that awareness. So verse 48 of the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. Dehantare Twagvi Bhagam Bhiti Bhutam Vichantayet Nakin Chid Antare Tasya Dhyayan Adhyaya Bhag Bhavet One should meditate on the body as only enclosed by skin with nothing inside. Meditating in this way, one attains the one who cannot be meditated upon. In other words, you attain the objectless, pure subject, the formless yodhe vavhe, that bhairava state, avikalpa, paramashena. Meditate on the body as only enclosed by skin with nothing inside. Meditate, in other words, on the spaciousness beneath the skin, as if the body is enclosed void. Now, verse 49. Hridya kashe nili naksha padma samputta madhyagaha ananya cheta subhaghe param saubhagyam apnuyat. 
If one merges one's senses in the space of the heart, that is, at the center between the two halves of the heart lotus, Padma, Samputa, Madhya means middle, so the middle of the two halves of the heart lotus, with an undistracted mind, then, O Blessed One, one attains supreme blessedness. So option number two is to meditate on the very center of the heart, the heart of your heart, if you will. And here is option number three. Verse 50. Sarva tasva shari rasya dvada shante manolayat dridha buddhe dridhi bhutam tatva lakshyam pravartate. If one's mind is absorbed at the dvada shanta or by meditating on that, the body is void in all parts with firm intellect. Then, the firmly established reality is revealed. Or alternately, alternately, verse 51, if one fixes the mind on this place every moment, in, when, in whatever way and in wherever place, then the fluctuations of the mind will dissolve, and within days, one will experience a most blessed state. So, that's a third option, is to meditate on the space above the crown of your head. It is not recommended that you meditate on any other point along the spine except the heart and perhaps also above the crown of the head. So I will leave you now to your practice. Either you're meditating on just the movement of energy up and down the spine or perhaps you're meditating on the body as being void enclosed by skin or you're meditating on the heart of your heart, keeping your mind fixed in the very center of the heart or finally you might be meditating with senses fixed on the crown of the head or really a region just above the crown of the head. It's 12 fingers width above the crown of the head. Dwa, Dasha, Anta, the end of 2 plus 10, so the end of 12, meaning it's about 12 finger width distance above the crown of the head. Don't actually measure it, just feel for it. All right, those are the three practices. I'll leave you to them. Please keep your eyes closed if you'd like or stay in your seat. And I'm simply going to chant and turn off the meeting. It was a true pleasure practicing with you all here today. Thank you so much, one and all, for coming. And I hope to see you in uh, Angela's prayer circle um, next. So thank you all. Good to see you, everyone. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnyat Purnam Mudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu Om That transcendent inside is whole this immanent outside is whole. From that wholeness inside pours forth this wholeness outside. The inside is not diminished by this pouring forth, nor is it aggrandized by this withdrawing in. From wholeness comes forth wholeness, and as wholeness to wholeness I salute thee. Om peace, peace, peace.